Hello, my name is Karin Skasal and welcome to Skasala Vision. I'd like to welcome you to our Artfelt website. Here you're going to find many tutorials on how to create the different projects that are available in kits, as well as how to do the Artfelt process in general. There's a lot of questions that come up frequently about art felt, such as what really is art felt? A lot of people assume that it's either needle felting, wet felting, or even fulling, but these three methods of felting are very different from art felt. Fulling is when you're actually knitting a piece and then you're throwing it in your washing machine to create a felt. When you are needle felting, you're actually using a barbed needle and you are penetrating the fibers so many times that all the air is removed out of them to create a piece of felt. This can take a very long time and a lot of this motion. It can get really tiring on your arms. Um, there's also wet felting. Wet felting is when you use also the fibers and you get them wet and with friction and water and sometimes soap can help too. If you rub them enough you also eliminate the air all out of the fibers and you create a felt as well. What art felt does is it takes all these different types of felting and takes the best attributes of all of them and creates a way for you to felt that's really quick and easy and doesn't take an awful lot of learning experience. The, the learning curve is much quicker than with any of these other methods. So it's all based on this paper. <clears throat> this is your art felt paper. And this was actually designed by Gerhard Schuppel of Schuppel Walle in Germany and his children go to the Waldorf schools and they were doing a lot of felting, wet felting and needle felting in the school. So every night he was getting messy and dirty or his arms were getting sore helping them felt and he said there's got to be a better way. Well the man is rather a genius and so he set his little mind to work and came out with this paper. What you do with this paper is you actually attach the roving to the paper. You don't felt it in, you just attach it to it. Yes with a felting needle but you don't have to felt it in. And then you get it wet and when you're done with the process, the actual felting process is in the dryer, you dissolve the paper. So it makes it a much quicker process. There's not a lot of rolling on your behalf, there's not a lot of stabbing on a piece, there's no knitting involved whatsoever, and you can just do things a heck of a lot quicker. The paper, a lot of people have questions about it. Is it really a paper? Well, it is. It's not really a woven. It's actually made just like regular paper is made, but it looks a little bit like a pellon. Um, the difference between this and, and a regular pellon or some of the dissolving pellons that are already available on the market is that this does not dissolve in your regular temperature water. You need your piece to get wet in order to fell it, felt it with this method. So this paper needs to withstand water, and it does. What makes a difference is that you can dissolve it with boiling water. So when you have finished felting your piece, you can pour boiling water over it, it will dissolve the paper, and you have your piece of felt. So when it comes to roving, you need to make sure that your roving is made of an animal's fleece. It needs to be natural. It can have silk in it, but it needs to be a natural fleece. It cannot be, per se, a rayon or an acrylic roving. That will not work. It will not felt. It has to be a natural fleece. So something from either a sheep, which is the most common, obviously. Merino works really well. Alpaca works as well. Um, and putting silk in there, you wouldn't want to use pure silk, but actually having silk in with the wool works very, very well because Although silk doesn't actually felt, it acts as a, a glue and a binder. So when it's mixed in with the wool, it makes it a little bit stronger. When you're using your wool, you're going to be able to get it in several different ways. We recommend either getting tops, or which we refer to as roving, it's, it's an interchangeable word, and you can get it in two separate ways in general. One is this width, and we call it standard, and the other one is like this, and we call this pencil roving. Um, for obvious reasons, it's about the width of a pencil. Basically what pencil roving is, is your standard roving, which is what we refer to when we have this width, except drawn out, and we call it drawn because that is terminology used in um, spinning, but it's drawn out to a pencil width. So we use this a lot for design work and so on. When we're using the standard roving, 
we don't normally just put it down on our paper and tack it in. In a lot of our videos, we refer to drafting. And by drafting, we mean pulling out small fibers at once, like this. Now, you can take your small fibers and you can use your little fingers and you can draw out small pieces. And it works quite well. What works best is actually using your whole fist to draw out fibers. So what I usually do is I don't start at a cut end. Cut ends just don't work very well. So I pull my roving apart in the middle and notice how it doesn't come apart very easily. You have to have your hands pretty far apart because the fibers are so long. And then it comes apart and leaves you these wonderful small um, tufts of uh, of fiber. These are really easy to draft out because you can just grab them little bits like this and when you pull it out you're just pulling out little bits. So as I draft I'm just pulling out small amounts of fiber. And like I said you can use your fingers if that's what you prefer to use. I like getting huge chunks and if I just use my fingers and my palm and just pull a little from here it works quite well. When you're cross hatching, you're laying all your fibers down in one direction, and then you're laying another coat in another direction. And the reason that this is important is because the fibers will felt together quicker and better. The fibers have tiny little ridges on them that you cannot see. And when you have all the little ridges going in one way and in one direction, it's all going to contract in that same direction. If you cross hatch, you're going to have it contract in two directions and the top layer is going to contract more to the bottom layer giving you a stronger piece. The only time that cross hatching is really not necessary for strength is if you are using one of our rovings that has silk in it. If you're using one with silk you can actually do it all in one direction and you will still have a very strong piece. But what you want to keep in mind is if you lay all your fibers in a horizontal or excuse me in a vertical line your piece is going to shrink vertically quite a bit, but it's not going to shrink widthwise, hardly at all. Whereas if you cross hatch, it's going to shrink evenly. So if you start with a square, you really want to make sure that you cross hatch evenly so that you end up with a square. If you lay it all in one direction, you will definitely end up with a rectangle. So cross hatching, you can do as many layers as you want. This would be considered two. This would be considered three. Now, remember, if I put one layer going this direction, another this direction, and now another one this direction, it's going to shrink more this direction because that's where the majority of the layers are being drafted. When it comes to felting needles, there's many different sizes out there, and people always ask, what size do I need? Well, it really doesn't matter all that much when you're doing the art felt method. However, the larger the, the barbs on the needle, the quicker you're going to get it tacked onto your paper. You can either use individual needles, which usually come with most of the kits that we get, and these work just fine when you're, when you're tacking it into the paper. If you want to do something a little bit quicker, a couple of different companies, including Clover, and I really like Clover's tool, they make this little tool that has five needles in it. And the reason I like this tool is, see this little piece of plastic here? It protects you from hitting yourself on the needles. However, when you're actually tacking it in, and here you can see how much more it tacks it in. You've got five puncture marks. Um, when it tacks it in, this little part actually retracts. And you can lock it in place, so if you put it in a bag, it's not going to come out. So that's made by Clover. That works quite well. Clover also makes a tool, and several other companies do, that has three needles. And these three little prongs, they also work well. Um, they do the same thing. The only thing is, is you have more, and you can see here, three little tufts that come out. You, you actually just uh, tack more into the paper at one time. In some cases, this is good too. One thing I might want to mention, though, is if you're using a very soft uh, roving and you want to get a very soft lightweight piece, you don't want to over tack. The less you manipulate your fibers with the needle, the softer your piece is going to be. So if you're doing something out of our cashmere roving or our in silk roving, you want to tack that into the paper the least amount necessary, just enough to hold it into place. If you over tack, it will just get a little bit stiffer when it actually felts. So try not to, uh, to over tack, especially with those. 
but once you have your layers drafted, you would do your tacking. And notice how quickly this goes. It, it is actually very quick, and like I said, it just has to be enough so that your roving doesn't fall off the paper. That means if you have a lot of design work, you have to do more, and if you have little design work, you can do less. And the tack board that I put it down on is this here. This is one that we actually sell. We call it an art felt tack board. Um, this one is about one inch thick. Most people uh, will have a tendency to want to tack pretty deep and they might go all the way through. As you can see here, this needle goes through to the end. So if you use one of these tack boards and you're working on a table that you want to protect the surface, put a layer of towels underneath the tack board. It's important, however, that your tack board be, be thick enough so that the barbs can go in. And on this one, the barbs go to here, and so this is just the perfect thickness. One of the questions that I get a lot is, when do I need a base coat, and what is a base coat? Well, a base coat is basically, <laughs> there we go again, um, what is going to felt into the solid piece of material. The rest of it, I would consider design work. Now, you can get a base coat in general um, just by using your standard roving. What I have tacked in here, which was actually three very, very lightweight coats, would give me a really great base coat. If I wanted to put design work on top of it, I could put it wherever I wanted. I wouldn't have to cover the whole piece whatsoever with design work. Um, it will hold itself and it will be a piece of roving all by itself. Whatever I put on top of it is just extra. If I were to use pencil roving, I can actually create a base coat with pencil roving, I would have to make sure that when I tack my pencil roving in, that it is overlapping. In other words, when I tack this here, I can't see paper in between. If I can see any paper in between, it's, it's not going to have anything to felt to. But if I were not to have this pencil roving overlap, what happens is, is I get holes. And sometimes it's nice. For instance, here on this scarf, we have just pencil roving. And one of the benefits of using just pencil roving for your base is that you have the same design on both sides. So it's like having a two-sided piece. This happens to be a scarf. So it works really well for that. But one of the drawbacks is, is if you don't overlap enough, you get really thin areas. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is not going to hold all that long. It's going to come apart eventually because it isn't felted. The overlapping of the circles was not all that strong right here, too. You can see this as well. It's just not strong. In these areas, there was absolutely no roving, and so you have the holes. And that's okay. That's what you're aiming for. But the weakness of this scarf, because for instance there, I was able to pull it apart. Because it was not overlapped properly um, is, is a concern on, on something like this. This is why we always say when you're using pencil roving and you're creating a base coat, make sure that you overlap it. And otherwise, here's a piece where you didn't need to overlap. This is also pencil roving, so you can create some marvelous designs with pencil roving. But if you look on the inside, there was a white base. In other words, they laid down a base like this with white, with white um, roving, and then they put the stripes on top of it. And you can tell, because when I pull it apart, you can see some of the white in between, which means that had I not had that white base, when I dissolved the paper, the roving would have come apart because it's not sticking together, it's sticking to the base. I'm frequently asked, how do I get my piece wet? In our videos, our tutorials for our kits, we show you the most uh, beneficial way to get the piece wet for that size in that, in that video. However, that doesn't mean you have to use that method. There's lots of different ways to get your piece wet. The main concerns that we have when getting your piece wet is that you don't schlep your piece around when the paper's wet because the paper gets weaker and you want to make sure that you're rolling your paper when it's wet and you're not carrying it from one place to another. So if you have small little pieces that you're doing, you can actually just go to your kitchen sink with a small piece and use your little sprayer in the sink, get it wet, and roll it right in the sink. It works really fast. 
and you don't have to bother with a spray bottle or anything else like that. If you make a huge gigantic piece, you can actually go on your deck and lay down a piece of plastic, put the piece on top of it, make sure that you have enough plastic on both ends, and you can use your hose and you can actually spray it with your hose, fold over the plastic and roll it up. That works really well too. The reason we show the other methods is because we don't all have decks that we can go spray down on. So that's where the, the lasagna pan comes in really handy. If you're doing a really long shawl and you're in a small apartment, the lasagna pan method is actually very convenient and uh, just put that towel in your lasagna pan and you can see that method. We actually have it in several videos on, on how to do it. Um, spray bottles, your hand gets really tired after a while if you have a big piece with the with a hand sprayer. That's why I like to use the spray bottles that have the pump and it creates pressure inside and all I have to do is, is pull the little trigger, the little nozzle and it sprays out. They're usually meant to spray pesticides and so on but they can be found very inexpensively at your hardware store and they come in very very handy. Just don't use them for pesticides and your felt. Um, and people always say, well, why not? Well, I'm not going to eat it, right? Well, you're not going to eat it, but those pesticides can do several things. Um, they can take color out of your, your roving. And not only that, uh, if you're going to be making a scarf or something and you have pesticides, you really don't want to wear it next to your neck. So just keep your bottles separate. Other ways to get your pieces wet in the bathtub. Uh, that works too if you don't want to use the lasagna uh, pan method. And if you don't have a spray bottle and you have a larger piece and you don't have a lasagna pan and you still want to do small sections at a time, what works really well is if you just use a drinking glass and you can fill it up with water. Use either a piece of saran wrap or Glad makes a self-sticking wrap that you might have at home. Put it over the top, poke some holes in it, and then you have a little shaker bottle and you can use a shaker bottle to get your piece wet. So there's lots of options. You don't need to go out and buy anything. Um, if you are going to be doing a lot of it, I do suggest that you buy one of the uh, pump sprayers. It's the tumbling action as your piece goes around and around and it gets hit as it goes in that dryer. Um, that is what actually causes the piece to felt. It's not the heat. Heat can help, soap can help, it can make it go a little bit faster, but it is not necessary. So if you're worried about the energy, you know, the heat that, that you need to use for your dryer, just turn it on air. Just have it tumble and just have your piece go round and round and round and it's that that agitation that's actually going to make it felt. If you want to put something in to make it felt a little bit quicker, a couple of tennis balls work really well. They, they hit the piece as it goes around. They put in croc shoes, um, all different kinds of things. But nothing is really necessary. Um, it's just if you want to help it go a little bit quicker. When putting your piece in the dryer, people always ask, can I put it in with my clothes? Um, the answer to that is yes, you can put it in with your clothes. It's not going to hurt anything. You are wrapping it in a plastic and then you actually have it in a trouser sock in general or in something else. There's really nothing that will damage your clothes. Um, the only thing is is that you don't want your art felt to ever get dry. So it's going to keep all your clothes from getting dry and that creates a problem. So in general, it's better not to put it in with clothes. If you happen to have some and you really want to put it in with it, go ahead. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. Does the plastic hurt the dryer? I have never seen the plastic melt in the dryer. Your piece is always wet, so the plastic is always wet. When you take your piece out of the dryer, how do you know it's finished? That is a really good question. There's many answers to this one. And sometimes you're probably going to start dissolving a paper and realize that it's not finished. And sometimes you're going to dissolve your paper and you're going to say, oh my God, it's overdone. That happens and I think that's totally unavoidable. But the best way to base it, besides experience, is when you take it out of the dryer is look at the back of the piece. Your paper does not shrink. Your roving shrinks, your paper does not. The more wrinkled your paper is, the more your piece has actually shrunk and has felted. Now, when you're making a scarf and something that's very lightweight, sometimes you want it 
to shrink about 50%. I know that sounds odd, but you start with something really wide and you want it to shrink this much, but you start with it really thin and you want it to shrink a lot, so your paper is going to be super duper wrinkled. Um, and sometimes you're going to have a piece that has four or five layers of roving on it that's pretty thick, such as a table runner or something. And on that one, the paper is not going to look that wrinkled because it doesn't actually shrink as much as it gets more compact in its thickness. So there's a lot of different factors that play a role in it. The best way to figure it out is if you are doing a project, say you're not doing a kit, but you're doing a project that's similar to one of the projects in our kits, see what we have done in that kit to, um, to let you know when it's finished. That might help you decide. When you aren't really quite sure, the best way to do it is take it out of the dryer anyways, get yourself a pot of boiling water, and just boil away, you know, a section about this big, the top of your palm of your hand, on the corner of the piece and see where you stand. Once you have that paper dissolved, then you can see exactly how far it's shrunk. Also, you can always go forward, but you can never go back. So it's actually better to dissolve the paper when it is felted, but maybe not as much as you want it felted, because once it's felted and you dissolve the paper, if you want it to be a little bit denser, you can always put it back in a bag in the dryer. I don't suggest just throwing it in the dryer. I always say put it in the bag. It contains it. It keeps all the fibers from going in your dryer and um, all around is just a little bit more controlled. So you can do it that way. But once you've over felted it, you can't go back. You can try. You can dissolve the paper and you can stretch and stretch and stretch and you can use an iron and make it go flat and bigger and so on. But you really can't go back to where you want it to be. So rather under felt and take it one step further each time, or if you happen to make a mistake and get something super thick, then throw it in your washing machine and make a carpet out of it or something. <laughs> that works too. So now your piece is felted and you've got this wacky piece of paper that sort of looks like it's glued to the back of your piece. How do you get it off? You've got to dissolve the paper. Don't try to peel it. It does not peel off. It's not meant to be peeled off. It's meant to be dissolved. It will not hurt your, your sink. It will not hurt your water. It will not hurt your environment. So what you need to do is just get boiling water on it and it will dissolve the paper. So how are you going to do that? There's lots of ways to do this as well. If you have small little pieces, once more, put them in your kitchen sink. Heat yourself a kettle of water. And I say a kettle. Uh, it has a handle rather than a pot. Um, it just, you have more control over it. If you have a pot, you gotta lift the pot and pour it. If you have a kettle, use a kettle. It just works better. But use that kettle of water, have the, the piece in your sink with the paper side up and pour the water directly on the paper and it should dissolve like that. Make sure that you rinse it really well and once it's cooled down, it doesn't take a long time if you actually um, put wet or cold water on it to rinse it down. You can squeeze it out. Don't wring it. Uh-uh. Just squeeze it, all right? If you wring it, you can stretch that wool. Just squeeze the water out and you can um, open it up. If it feels sticky, then you know there's still starch in there because this is starch-based paper. So then what you want to do is pour more boiling water on it, not hot water, boiling water. And this is the number one thing that people make the error. They say, I have really hot water at home. It comes out, I've got an automatic heater, instant heater. Those things usually do not work. The water is not hot enough. It really needs to boil. You need to see bubbles. Another way of doing it is actually making yourself a big pot of water on your, your stove and then you can actually dip your entire piece in and then pull it out. Do not do this with bare hands. Do not do this with gloved hands, even rubber gloves. I'll tell you, I've scorched my hands before. Don't try it. Um, use a, a pasta scooper, you know, the kind that has the little prongs. Use one of those or use something to take it out of the pot, but don't use your hands. And if possible, have a bowl sitting right next to your pot. That way you can pull it right out of your pot, put it in the bowl, and then carry it over to the sink. Don't try to pull it out of your pot and walk across your kitchen floor. If you're barefoot, you're gonna get boiling water on your feet, and that hurts too. And I learned that one from experience as well. So put it in the bowl, carry the bowl over to the sink, dump it in the sink, and then use your cold water and rinse it. Um, this, if you're actually doing quite a few pieces, works quite well because you can put them all in the pot. 
Um, wouldn't suggest doing it at the same time. I would suggest putting one piece in the pot at a time and taking it out. Don't freak out if you notice that the water in the pot is changing color. It will. None of these rovings, there's, there's really not a lot of inks or inks, dyes out there that can withstand boiling water and stay exactly the way they are. But if you actually just put your piece in and you leave it in there, you know, stir it around a little bit, 30 seconds or something, um, a little, a little bit of the color might come out in the water, but it's not going to affect your piece whatsoever. If you have a black and white piece, then I would be careful. Then I would actually do the sink method and I would do one portion at a time um, with the paper up and dissolve the water and just let that ink or the color go right through it and right down the drain. You don't want to put a piece that has a lot of white in it in that pot because the white will absorb color. Another way to dissolve paper, you can also do it in your bathtub with, with boiling water. Um, shower works great. Anything that has a drain, and actually if you, have a, if you don't have a bathtub and you just have a shower, that works, you know, depending on how big your shower is, for pretty big pieces. Um, this way you don't have to worry about, you know, laying the piece out several different times and you can just use the boiling water and pour it right over it. I think that's about all the ways to dissolve your paper. The one thing that I always say to keep in mind though is that the water needs to be boiling, meaning you have to see bubbles. Don't boil it, go pick up the telephone, come back five minutes later and think it's still boiling. It needs to be boiling and it will dissolve the paper. If your hands feel sticky, there's still starch in it, rinse it out more or use more boiling water and get it more out.